So I have four pictures, and our task as we begin this morning is to decide whether or not these pictures are the real deal or are they Photoshop fakes. Okay, are you ready? Just is this real or is it a fake? That's all we have to figure out. Here's the first picture. The see-through butterfly. What do you think? Real? Fake? That is a very real picture of the very real and appropriately named glass-winged butterfly. Who knew? Real picture. How about the next one? What do you think? Beautiful blue watermelon known as Japanese moon melon. Is that legit or is that fake? It's totally a phony. <laughs> That's a Photoshop picture that went viral on social media purporting to be the non-existent Japanese moon melon. Here's a third picture. What do you think? A nice dusting, a light dusting of snow on the Great Pyramids of Giza. A few years ago, for the first time in 112 years, a light snow fell over Cairo and that was the end effect. What do you think? Is that a real picture or is that a fake? It's totally a fake. I suppose the day that it snows in Cairo, we got big problems. Nope, total Photoshop fake. What about this one? Is that legit? Those guys have a game, game of tennis on the wing of the biplane? That's just weird enough that you're thinking that's got to be legit, right? It totally is. And I hope those guys took more than one tennis ball. That's just a little reminder that you and I live in a world where there's plenty of stuff that's for real and there's plenty of stuff that isn't. And it's one thing sorting out the fact from the fiction when we're talking about four pictures, but it becomes so crucial that we have the tools to be able to sort out in our lives fact from fiction and truth from error when it comes to teaching about which it's claimed is the unfolding of God's truth. And that's really what our scripture this morning is all about. 2 Peter chapter 2, 1 to 9. In the church Bibles, it begins on page 853 and continues to 854. And really the question that this text answers is this. How can we as followers of Jesus be equipped to discern in our world and in our lives that which is absolutely the truth from God to us and that which is deceptive and in error? That's the angle of this passage of Scripture. What we find then as we come to 2 Peter chapter 2 is that there's a fairly dramatic change in the tone of the Apostle Peter. Chapter 1 concludes on this up note. Peter is excited and he's enthused to remind his friends and us that in the Bible we have the true and unchanging Word of God. And we can absolutely build our lives upon the truth and the claims of Scripture. Now in chapter 2 we have a hard word from Peter. And in this portion of scripture, he's going to have hard words to speak about those in his day who under the guise of speaking the truth from God would in fact be spewing deception and falsehoods within the churches, again claiming that they were speaking for God. This was a problem, a grave threat that hung over the churches in the days of the first century in which the apostle Peter lived. So the question for the believers in Christ Jesus in those churches, the question for us this morning is just that. How do we sort through fact and fiction? How do we discern truth from error? That's really what this passage of scripture is about. Now in the first century, there were at least three strains of false teaching that were being propagated at that time in history. There would have been a group of people that was twisting the teachings of Jesus and the words of the apostles to manipulate people just so that the false teachers could get the people's money. So that was a concern to Peter. There was another group of individuals who were stating that if you really wanted to know God, it was not enough to yield your life and faith to Christ Jesus. You also 
had to follow the Old Testament Mosaic law, also a falsehood that Peter was very concerned about. And then there was yet another group that was teaching that you could be a follower of Jesus by faith and live your life however immorally you chose to live it. And so in a world where there were so many different voices proclaiming so many different things, how could the believers in the body of Christ sort through all of that and settle down on what was actually the truth from God? Again, the same question is relevant for the times in which you and I live. And there are three principles in this passage of Scripture to that end that the follower of Christ would be equipped to discern truth from God from that which is error. And I want you to look, first of all, at the first half of verse 1, where the first principle is this. We need to realize the presence of false teaching. We live in a world in which there is plenty of falsehood. And the first step to camping out on God's life-giving truth is to acknowledge that we live in that kind of world. We can't be naive. We need to be heads up because there is false teaching that is out there in the very world in which we live. Verse 1. Peter writes, but there were also false prophets, literally pseudo-prophets. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. So Peter's statement here about false teaching can be reduced to three words. It is here. Peter reminded his friends that in the Old Testament, in fact, going all the way back to the Garden of Eden, where the evil one lied to Adam and Eve through the serpent, said things that God did not say, all the way through the journey that was the children of Israel in the Old Testament. Deceptions and false teachers popped up to state that they were saying things for God when in fact they really were not. So for example, in the days of the prophet Jeremiah, God gave Jeremiah a message for the citizens of Judah. And that message was this. The Babylonian invasion of Judah would happen, and the Babylonian captivity subsequent to that would take place, and the best thing that the Jewish people could do would be to surrender to the invading Babylonians, and God would preserve his people through the captivity. That was a very hard word for Jeremiah to have to bring from God to his people, and it was not well received. Jeremiah was hated for bringing that word. At the same time, there were false prophets who stepped up to say, do not listen to Jeremiah. He doesn't know what he's talking about. We've got the real word from God. And God's word to the king is, go ahead and fight the Babylonians. You've got this. God is on our side. God has granted us victory. And it was an appealing word to the king, but it was not a word from God. And in the end, Things unfolded exactly as the word of the Lord as proclaimed through the prophet Jeremiah. Now Peter would be writing to the people that he was concerned about in the first century, reminding them of this perspective on history. Because that which was a part of the journey of Israel in the Old Testament and imperiled the nation was very much in play in the first century amongst the churches so the followers of Jesus needed to be heads up. We also live in a day where there's plenty of falsehood out there and it behooves followers of Jesus to be vigilant. Now let me say this. There are hundreds and thousands upon thousands of local church faith communities and ministries in Calgary, across Canada, and around the world that we identify with at Harvest. We share the same core convictions with respect to the Word of God. We share the same conviction about the truth of the Gospel, that Jesus died and rose to set people free. And in that regard, we're pulling in the same direction. Amen? Multiplied thousands of local churches and ministries. All over the world, we may have different denominational tags and minor doctrinal differences, but on the bullseye issues, the core truths of God's Word, 
We're on mission with Jesus together. And that oneness in Christ is to be celebrated. By the same token, we've got to be so very aware of the fact that, for example, on the North American continent alone, there are hundreds of false ministries and teachers that are spewing deceptions in the name of God that don't reflect the truth of God. So we have to be careful. A 19th century statement, statesman by the name of Wendell Phillips said that eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. In other words, in this land in which we live where we enjoy the freedoms that we do, nothing's to be taken for granted. The same is true in the churches as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where God's truth is proclaimed, the truth sets people free. Amen? But that's not a liberty to be taken for granted. We have to be vigilant. We have to be heads up. So far as God's truth is concerned. In fact, the elders, the shepherds of this church have a solemn responsibility before God to steward the ministry of the Word of God, ensuring that it reflects nothing less than God's heart for the truth. And I'm not trying to be melodramatic, but I really believe this. If, God forbid, I got to a place in my life where I was saying things that did not square with the Scriptures, your elders would have a responsibility before God to fire me in a heartbeat. It's that serious. But really... It's a vigilance, and it's a seriousness that every follower of the Lord Jesus Christ needs to own, that we're going to be careful when it comes to God's truth and God's word. And in that regard, the first step to guarding the truth and to discerning fact from fiction is acknowledging that we got to keep our heads up because we're living in an era where there is plenty of deception, plenty of falsehood out there. So it all begs the question then, how specifically would we as followers of Jesus and as a faith community do that? Discern truth from error. Let's talk secondly about this. Peter says the second principle now, the second step to discerning truth from error is to recognize the posture of false teaching. Follow along as I read verses 1 to the middle of verse 3. He writes, But there were false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed... These teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Peter was super concerned that false teachers in the name of the living God, though they didn't actually represent the living God at all, could potentially move into those faith communities in the first century. And those false teachers, you know, they could be persuasive. They could be very compelling. They could be charismatic. They could take their error and their deception and wrap it up in acts of love that would make it look so wonderful to everybody. So how would those early followers of Jesus wade their way through all of that? The same question is so relevant for each of us. False teachers can be incredibly persuasive. How do we discern truth from error? In those verses... God's Holy Spirit, through the writings of the Apostle Peter, gives us a three-point plan. Peter says, first of all, we need to start by looking at the message. Actually examine the message. So he gives us this phrase. False teachers will secretly introduce destructive heresies. In other words, false teachers will often take a kernel of truth and use that kernel of truth as the platform from which they will spew their lies and deceptions. So we've got to examine carefully the message to discern whether or not a message totally squares with what God would say to his people. And how do we discern the message, whether it's truth or not? 
two simple but crucial tests. There's first of all the scripture test. Any messenger that claims to bring a message from God must bring that message only from the word of God. But if someone says, I've got a word from God, and they've got different sources, different holy books, that immediately raises in our minds red flags because this could well be someone who's got a kernel of truth that they're using as the platform for the deceptions that they're about to convey. The scripture test says this, a person who's going to speak for God and his truth will speak only from God's word. Here's a second test. It's the Savior test. What is a ministry? What is a person proclaiming to speak the truth have to say about Jesus? Who he is and what the Lord Jesus Christ has accomplished. Notice what Peter had to say about some of these false teachers that were a threat to the early church. He says in the middle of verse 1 that they even deny the sovereign Lord. So there are individuals running around claiming to speak for God. Meanwhile, they were denying the Lord Jesus Christ in some manner. So that we might discern truth from error, we ask ourselves with respect to a message that we may be hearing, what does this person in ministry have to say about the Lord Jesus does this person believe that Jesus is the eternal Son of God? Does he believe that he's God incarnate, God come in the flesh? Does this person believe that Jesus lived a perfect life and was as the perfect God-man, uniquely qualified to give himself on the cross for the sins of the world? Does this person believe that Jesus rose from the dead and that he's soon to return? What does a ministry or a person profess about the Lord Jesus Christ and throughout history where teaching gets off the rails almost always it has something to do with the person and work and ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ so this one's crucial in the early days of my ministry I found myself hanging out with a larger group of colleagues that reflected the breadth of the theological spectrum. Within that group, there are people that believe that the Bible is God's word. And within that group, there are also people who openly confessed that they did not believe the Bible, all of it, to be God's word. So the conversation in time moved to some of the historic creeds that the early church affirmed. Like, for example, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. And in the song that Carol and the team led us earlier, The Creed, that's essentially a contemporary version of the Apostles' Creed. Those are both profound statements of theological orthodoxy that affirm the core truths of God's Word and the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in the group, there was this guy, Michael who openly confessed that he did not believe that Jesus was God, and he did not believe that Jesus rose from the dead, and yet in the next breath, Michael said, but I affirm the historic creeds. Well, that pushed my buttons. Because the Apostles' Creed, for example, confidently confesses that Christ Jesus is risen from the dead. What do you do with that? Well, in time... I figured out with someone's help what Michael was doing. When he said, I affirm the historic creeds, he was just saying that I affirm that at some point in history past, the church at the time embraced and affirmed those creeds. But I don't personally believe them. What I'm saying is false teachers will often use the same words, but they work with a very different dictionary. So we have to be heads up. We have to be vigilant. We have to examine the message and ask for God, the Holy Spirit's help. Here's the second test that we would embrace in order to recognize the posture of false teaching as we seek to discern truth from error. Look at the morality of the teacher. Examine and ask questions about the lifestyle of the individual who claims to be speaking God's truth. Look back to the second verse. Peter writes, many will follow their, that's the false teachers, depraved conduct. 
The word depraved conduct translates one word that would literally be sensuality, and the idea here is illicit sensuality. So often through the history of the church and in the Old Testament times, where you had pseudo-prophets, false prophets who claimed to speak for God but were not, incredibly evil acts of sexual immorality also were a part of what those people were involved in. Now, if uh, you're a shade older or like me, you may remember 25 years ago, this month, a terrible event that unfolded in Waco, Texas. So there was a cult group there called the Branch Davidians, led by a guy named David Koresh. And it had a horrible ending, as you may remember. But get this. After the fact, it came out that David Koresh, the Messiah leader of this false cult, he'd fathered at least 15 children by numerous different women, some as young as age 12. A young lady by the name of Kiri, after the fact, would testify that from age 10 on, David sexually assaulted her, and after each such heinous act, he would read to her, if you can believe it, the Bible. So again, in history, where there has been a falsehood and a deception being taught under the guise of being the Word of God, oftentimes, that same ministry or that same individual, their lifestyle has been marked by over-the-top sexual immorality. So to discern the legitimacy of a message, look at the lifestyle of the messenger. That's really what Peter was saying. There are people in his day that were saying, we speak for God, and their lifestyles conveyed something completely the opposite. One more test to apply, to discern the truth from the error. Peter says, look at motive. Look at a person's motive so far as their ministry is concerned. First part of verse 3. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. The word fabricated is kind of interesting. It's plasmos in the original, and it means to bend, to shape, to mold. We get our English word plastic from it. And if you apply heat to plastic, well, you can reshape it. You can bend it however you want. It's not hard to figure out where Peter was going when he chose that word under the Spirit's inspiration to describe the false teachers. They were taking God's truth, God's message, and they were bending it. They are twisting it. They were shaping it to suit their own greedy, selfish ends. And what were their greedy, selfish ends? They were out to fleece the flock. This was a prophet who was motivated by P-R-O-F-I-T, prophet. It was all about the money for them. And where that kind of motivation is evidently in play, that again is a red flag that something does not sit square here so far as God's truth is concerned. All right. So that we might be equipped as followers of Jesus to discern truth from error, so that Peter's readers might similarly be equipped. He reminded them to be heads up. Realize the presence of false teaching. That's not another place or another era. That's the world in which we live. Secondly, recognize the posture of false teachers by looking at the message, their morality, and the motive behind what it is that they do. The passage of Scripture winds up now in the middle of verse 3 to the end of verse 9 with Peter concluding with a hard word on this. Remember the punishment of false teaching. Remember how it all ends up for those who unrepentantly continue to proclaim falsehood in the name of God. Middle of verse 3. Peter writes of the false teachers, Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. Before we look at verses 4 to 9, let's remind ourselves of a fundamental aspect of the character of the Lord our God. 
In Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 16, the prophet Isaiah says of our Lord that he's the God of truth. In Revelation 15 and verse 3, the apostle John writes these words. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways. And in Hebrews 6 verse 18, God's word says it's impossible for God to tell a lie. So our God, in his very character, is truth. He embodies truth. And through all eternity, God only operates in the realm of truth, and he's passionate for the truth. Now, contrasting that aspect of the character of the Lord our God is the evil one. And what did Jesus in John 8, verse 44, have to say about the devil? Jesus said the devil, on the other hand, is a liar. And he's the father of lies, and he's been lying from the very beginning. So every place where we see deception at work, that's a realm in which the evil one is present and doing his thing because that's the way the enemy operates. In the realm of falsehood and deception. Meanwhile, our God does nothing but operate in the realm of truth. Can we begin to see why, for example, in Proverbs 6 and verse 9, our God would say that he detests the false witness who spews lies. It's because God is passionate for the truth. God is the truth. And God, having given to us a written revelation of his truth to us in the word of God, is zealous that all who would claim to teach God's word would do it truthfully and with integrity. And God's heart is incredibly grieved when people mess with his message while claiming to be his representatives. With that, Peter unfolds some tough talk in verses 4 to 9 as descriptive of how God viewed those individuals in the first century and at any time in history who again with unrepentant and arrogant hearts, in God's name no less, teach that which is deception. Verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, who is distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard, if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. Peter gives three illustrations to buttress his claim that God's just judgment hangs over all who spew deception unrepentantly in the name of God. He says, first of all, think about the angels who were in the very presence of Almighty God, but then chose to align themselves with Lucifer when Lucifer, at some point in the past, rebelled against Almighty God. And Scripture suggests that one-third of God's holy angels rebelled against God and joined forces with the evil one. Peter says, if those angels created beings who were in the very presence of the living God and violated the truth of God and rebelled against God, if those angels have been condemned to hell apart from Almighty God, then do the false teachers actually think they as mere mortals are going to get away themselves with violating God's truth? I mean, he's posing a rhetorical question. His obvious answer is there's no way the false teachers are getting to get a jail free card. That is not happening to them. And then Peter talks about the flood that came upon the world. 
Again, because people in disobedience and violation against God's truth and a blatant disregard for God's truth rebelled against the Lord so that God brought the flood and saved just Noah and his family via the ark. If that's the way God dealt with humanity and its blatant disregard for the truth, then what can false teachers who are much smaller in number, relatively speaking, expect from God if they persist in telling falsehoods in God's name. They too will experience the just judgment of God. And the last example that Peter gave was that of Sodom and Gomorrah. Two ancient cities that again lived willfully in flagrant acts of evil despising the very truth of God by the lives that they lived so that God brought judgment upon those two cities and by now we're getting Peter's theme. If they didn't get away with so violating, ignoring, and abusing God's truth, the people in Sodom and Gomorrah, then the false teachers won't either. In all of that, the apostle Peter also notes, though, Two individuals, Noah and Lot. Let's talk about Lot for a minute because Noah calls him a righteous guy. Now, if you've read a little bit of Lot's story in the Old Testament, you will agree with me that his character is not exactly, exactly a shining example of righteousness and integrity. So what's with this? Lot was a righteous guy. Lot had chosen to yield his life and faith to the living God and as a result, he was living in an imputed righteousness. A righteousness that was from the grace of God that was put upon his account. This happens for every person who chooses in faith to yield their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're forgiven and we're robed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus. So Lot by no means was perfect and neither am I or are we, but he had a righteousness that was from God so God pursued Noah and Lot and rescued them even as God brought about his judgment and his punishment upon those who persisted in violation of his truth. And Peter's point is, this is how seriously God Almighty takes his truth and the conveying of it. Those false teachers in the past, the false teachers in Peter's day, even in our day, unless they turn from their deception and turn wholeheartedly and in humility to God because the Father is so serious that the integrity of His truth be upheld, they will be on the wrong side of dealing with the Almighty. A Bible college professor was doing a lecture with a group of students and he was using a handful of 10 cent words. When the janitor happened by, and peeked his head into the lecture hall. And the prof invited the janitor in, and then invited the janitor to offer his two cents on the topic of conversation that was going on in the class that day. The janitor said, well, I don't know that I really have anything to offer by way of adding to the conversation that's going on here, but I will say this. I've read the book to the end, and Jesus wins. Amen? Amen. Peter would say to us this morning something similar. Followers of Jesus by faith, be vigilant. Be heads up. Know that you're living in a world where falsehood abounds. Apply diligently this game plan from Scripture for discerning truth from error and then rest with hope-filled confidence in the fact that Almighty God's going to preserve His truth. Amen? and read the end of the book. Guess what? God and his truth wins, and so do we. And that's our confidence. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you that your word is truth. Thank you that you've provided to us in the Holy Scriptures a standard, which is to us living and active. Your word from your heart to us. And it transforms us. Thank you for your truth. Grant that we at Harvest would carefully and wisely, in a way that glorifies you, Father God, steward your word of truth. And help us, Father, as we seek to build our lives with the help of your Holy Spirit upon your unchanging word of truth, Lord Jesus. Help us increasingly.
as followers of the Lord Jesus, to live in the realm of truth in all of the places that we interact with other people. And help us to be careful. Help us to be vigilant. And thank you that you'll help us at all of that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.